hello, and thank you so much for joining us for this Facebook Live. We're here to celebrate International Women's Day. Let's all give ourselves a little high five. Woo! <laughs> um, we're here with Fair, and uh, my name is Hillary Carter. I'm a food allergy mom. I'm a member of the Board of Governors for Fair, and I'm the host of Take Action, which you can find on the Living Teal channel. Today, I'm joined by three complete powerhouse women. They all own food allergy focused businesses. So welcome ladies. We have Sarah Matheson, give us a wave. She's the co-founder co and creative director of Hungry Harry's. We have Nubian Simmons, the founder of The Pink Bakery. Hello. <laughs> and Nicole Wilson, co-founder and president of Everybody Eat. Hello. So ladies. Thank you so much for joining me. I am so excited. We got to have a little meet and greet a couple of weeks ago. We were like, we couldn't stop talking. So I know this is going to be so fun for everyone watching today. So first off, I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about you and your business. We'll get into food allergies late, later, but let's just start with, with the highlights. Nicole, why don't you, why don't you kick us off? to do so and it's such a pleasure to be in such phenomenal company today um like uh, uh um, like hillary shared my name is nicole wilson i'm the co-founder and president of everybody eats and uh our our purpose is really uh we're a family-based company and we are we exist to bring people together over a shared love of delicious food regardless of special diets and for us we want to make sure that our food is delicious and craveable because the problem we're solving is uh um, everybody eating together. And so we can't do that if food's not delicious. Absolutely. Well, welcome. And thank you so much for being with us today. Moving on, please introduce yourself. So um, again, I'm, I also am so happy to be here today. So I want to thank you and Fair for this uh, amazing opportunity. So my name is Nubian Simmons. I'm the owner of The Pink Bakery. And The Pink Bakery is the first premium top allergen-free baking mix company um, our mixes only require oil and water and our frostings only require a little like a couple of tablespoons of water. Everything is naturally vegan and made in our own dedicated allergen free facility. That's so awesome. And I was looking all through your website and I love that for the ingredients, the first thing you list is lots of love. <laughs> That's awesome. And Sarah, my dear friend, tell us a little bit about you. So, hi guys, I'm Sarah Matheson. I'm the co-founder and creative director of Hungry Harry's. I'm a food allergy mum. I'm a documentary photographer. I'm Australian, so I'm from the other side of the world. Um, and it's a pleasure to actually see FAIR and help elevate the story of women. Because food allergy mums, women in business, we see differently and we solve problems differently. And we do it in a very creative way. So it's a joy for all of us to be able to share that. Absolutely. And one thing I want to mention before we really, really dive in, for those of you who are watching live today, if you have any questions you'd like for us to cover, please just make a little question in the comment box right there on Facebook, and we'll make sure and get to them at the end. So ladies, let's go, let's go, let's go into the big elephant in the room, food allergies. As we all know, there's 32 million Americans with food allergies, and 85 million Americans make purchasing decisions based on food allergies, because as we all know, if someone in your home has a dietary restriction or allergy, we're all going to purchase around it and eat around it. So, you know, big, big marketplace here. Tell me a little bit about how food allergy has impacted your life. Uh, Nubian, why don't you start first? Um, I've been allergic to milk since I was born. So I was born with food allergies and I've had to navigate life with that, um, with that, right, that, like, I guess I would say like, that, I don't call it luggage, <laughs> but that just hanging over me. I don't know a better word to, to say other than that. Um, I've had to learn how to um, really kind of just make sure that no matter what anybody else said about me or the experiences that I've encountered, that I was okay with myself, which was really hard. Um, because at the, at the time when I was diagnosed with food allergies, it, it was a long time ago. I look younger than I am. It was a long time ago. Um, and you know there there were times where people would tell me, oh, you're you're faking, or you really don't have that, or you know you're black, black people don't have that, and it's like, ooh, like so there were so many stigmas and uh, you know around food allergies that you know I've had to learn how to break through, 
Um, and the reason why I started the Pink Bakery, I don't know if you're going to ask this in, an, in another question, but was because I just wanted something to eat that would taste good, that wouldn't hurt me. The things that were made available on the on the marketplace at the time were nasty. Um, <laughs> everything tastes like rice crackers or rice cakes. And nothing against those, but if I want a brownie, I don't want it to taste like a rice cake. And so um, it took me years, um, about five years, to finally figure out how to make desserts that would taste amazing. And again, without eggs, you know, without milk, without these traditional ingredients that are used in baking. I have no baking background either. Um, I just had a desire to learn how to make something, again, that would taste good and not hurt me. And so, um, you know, again, I had a lot of anxiety surrounding food because, again, Foods can, they can cause a reaction. They can kill you, right? Um, and so you see the world totally differently. And so again, it took a long time to learn how to navigate that space. And again, there weren't products like there are available, products that are available now, like it was back then. So we were, we were really limited. Um, and so we suffered a lot through that. And you know, my poor mother and my, my poor siblings, because you spoke about the 85 million people um, that are impacted by it. So, but anyway, saying all that to say, I've lived with it my whole life. I still try to navigate it now. I'm also allergic to, severely allergic to wheat, which is a very difficult allergy to manage because it's everywhere. Um, and so, you know, I just take it day by day, so. There's so much there. So my, my youngest son is allergic to dairy, wheat and egg. And so I feel your pain. I know how hard it is to avoid those three. And and my kids were diagnosed 10 years ago. And it's amazing, even in this 10 years, how many new products are on the market. So grateful for women like you who are creating these amazing companies and products for our community. Sarah, tell us a little bit about your journey with food allergies and sort of why you decided to start Hungry Harry's. Okay, so Harry's first anaphylaxis was a little bit traumatic. We're actually in Thailand. He ate a cookie, had an anaphylaxis. We ended up in an ambulance on Phuket, in Phuket. And then we're told he's got allergies to something. Uh, we were living in Sydney at the time. He, he was diagnosed dangerously allergic to all tree nuts and intolerant to dairy, gluten, eggs, soy, and seafood. That basically wipes out half the food on the earth. We moved to America. So I was in Australia, navigated looking at food and trying to find food that was suitable and Harry's now 16 so this is a while ago and then moved to America and I had to do it all again I had to relearn all the brands I had to try and find who had the best protocols and it was really frustrating but the moment that we realized we were going to take Hungry Harry's from something that we were using in our own kitchen and share it with the food allergy community was when Harry's lunchbox came home empty you know, and as a food allergy mom, I was like, yes, he ate his lunch. And so I went, Harry, congratulations, you ate your lunch. And he turned around and went, yeah, no, I didn't. Hang on a minute. Who ate your lunch? Vivian. Why did the non-allergy kid eat the allergy kid's lunch? Huh, mom, she likes it. So it was at that point, it was a Friday afternoon, and I get a visceral reaction when I tell this story because I had a muffin in my hand and I lifted it up and said to Rob, there's something in this. If the non-allergy kid wants to eat the allergy kid's lunch, we've solved the basic problem, everyone's included. And that we kind of have gone from there. We're now in, um, what are we, where we sell in supermarkets in 35 states. We have customers in every state across the U.S., um, we sell via our website and also um, through Amazon. So, you know, and we're a team of four and a half people. So we do a lot. But You we, do a lot. We love what we do. And it makes a difference to my life and to our life and to Harry's perception of what he can go and achieve. So it, it changes people's the food allergy community. Yes, you can go and do it because you've got safe food to allow you to do it. Not only can you go do it because you have safe food, you can share it with your friends and family who are not food allergic and they're going to love it too. And that, that's a huge win, huge win. Nicole, tell us about your journey. Sure. So my journey actually also started with, uh, with my kiddos. Um, my daughter, um, Ella and son Carter are both severely lactose intolerant. Their body does not make the enzyme that breaks down lactose. So they can't have dairy in any form. Um, whether it's baked, broiled, barbecued, no dairy. <laughs> and so we were navigating that um, with, uh, uh, but early on, it was just tummy trouble. Even though Carter had to have soy formula, no one wanted to say there's a dairy allergy or a sensitivity here. And so it was tummy trouble. And we went through 
cleanses and we went through like all the stuff that you all know way too much about, <laughs> um, but you know, a couple different pediatric GIs. And then finally the, G- the GI that we have now says we need to do an endoscopy and really go in and see what's happening. And that's when we finally had confirmation. And so I went from a kid who had belly numbers. So she had one for how hot her stomach was and one for how much pain she was in. And so this is a three-year-old talking about belly numbers of eight and nine, you know, 10, you're doubled over in pain. And so while I was on this journey with my two kiddos, my son, you know, breaking out from eczema, everything that when you look back on it, you say, of course, that's what it was, but nobody wanted to diagnose it that way. And so going through this journey, creating the learnings, and then I meet my phenomenal co-founder, Trish Thomas, who has an autoimmune disease. Um, And after having baby number two, realized she had Hashimoto's and she can't eat egg, she can't eat gluten, soy, dairy, or corn. And so she and I were kind of spitballing at the dining room table, trying to figure out what's a company that the world really needs. Uh, and, and we said, you know what, it's really about creating delicious food that people can share, but doing it in a way where we can grab the most people. So we said, we're not going to stop at the top eight. We're going to go and look at the EU top 14, and we're going to make our food free of the EU top 14 and also corn because we realized that for many folks who have a wheat gluten sensitivity, they also have a corn gluten sensitivity and don't know it because most gluten-free foods use corn as a filler. And so we said, we don't want to, we don't want to create more problems with, with new ones. So let's try to, let's try to really figure out what we're going to do. Um, and, and that's how, that's how everybody eat was born. And so it is a necessity as a mother of invention just like these two lovely women know here. Um, and, uh, and, and you find inspiration in all, pla- in all places. I'm so amazed by all three of you because what's coming to me as I'm listening to this is that women, when faced with a problem, figure out how to freaking fix it. And so <laughs> I love it. that you, know, you had a personal issue in your family and you decided to go out and make this better for the world. So rock on sisters. Um, and along that, that line, I'd love to know what you each think is your superpower as a female entrepreneur. Sarah, I'm going to come to you first. Um, I will say empathy an understanding of strategy and a, a faith in creativity. As a food allergy mom, I know what it feels like to stand in the supermarket and go, yep, pick it up. Nope. Nope. And I know what it feels like when that rite of passage of being able to, I'm a big baker. So to be able to bake and share something with a family member or a neighbor or at a school event or a community event, and then nobody want to eat it because it didn't taste good. And I'm like, no, 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 everyone's included. You know, the mixes taste like regular food. The strategy, understanding how to scale, understanding what the supermarket landscape looks like, understanding how unbelievably complex it is to go from our businesses and grow to meet capacity and meet demand. And then creativity. I'm a documentary photographer. Um, so I, I, everything's about the visual story. And we lift up our home bakers and say to them, take the photo, tell your own story and we'll lift you up. I have another superpower. I'm actually profoundly dyslexic, which means my brain works completely differently. My brain doesn't do this. My brain looks like this and pulls relationships together and pulls systems together or problems. Entrepreneurship is about taking a maze and making it into a system. It is about balancing production over here with the the supermarket that's made contact and wants you to come on board with okay, you need new bags, when are you going to print those? It's about all of this complexity, getting it to go on one line. And if you look at entrepreneurship um, and entrepreneurs around the world, you'll find a lot of them are actually dyslexic. So it's, it's just this trait that we have. That's so interesting. And I love hearing about that and learning about that. And I do, you're like the most creatively talented person I know. So I love how you use that as a big win for yourself and your business. Thank you for, for sharing, Sarah. Nubian, how about you? What do you believe is your superpower? So my superpower is the ability to solve incredibly complex problems and make it look easy. Um, I've had several people say to me, well, you know, you make it look so easy to be an entrepreneur. And I'm like, but you don't see that I 
the, the hours that I put in where I'm not sleeping, where I'm researching, where I'm baking, you know, like all that stuff. Um, so I feel like that's an incredible um, compliment to say that I make it look easy. Um, so yeah, that would be my superpower. I love it. And I feel like that's such a female trait too, right? We're like, put some lipstick on, get it done. No one needs to know the hot mess that's going on back here. Uh, sure. Nicole, how about you? Please share with us what you believe is your superpower. I, th I think my superpower is seeing the brilliance of an idea and being able to operationalize it into reality. I think um, there are so many great ideas out there. And I think this is one way where I think about how my co-founder and I really, really work together. She's a four-time entrepreneur and she's great. Like she comes out with an idea and other folks just sort of like stand there and like look at it. <laughs> and, 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 and freeze a little bit. And I look at it and I'm like, ah, I know how to do this. I know how this is brilliant. I know how we can do this. And so, so it's a great combination of just her ability to see around corners and have foresight and then say, okay, now how do we turn this into something? And then, and then really working to say, all of a sudden it's real. Um, and, uh, but to your point, Nubian, all of a sudden is sleepless nights, spreadsheets, PowerPoint presentations, in the kitchen, making up all kinds of recipes, adding, you know, hot sauce here and cooking it, you know, all these sort of things. Um, but I think also another is resilience. I think um, one of the things that Trish and I always talk about is entrepre entrepreneurial resilience, because it is a lot of times it's one step forward, three and a half back, and then a sprint five ahead. And so how do you always have plan A, B, C, and D so that you can buffer the, um, uh, the shocks. But then also, how do you say, you know what, there's, there's always a solution. We're going to find it. It may not be ideal. It may not be what we thought. It may look differently. But how do we not become paralyzed by fear, but just get in there and get after it and just keep slogging away, pulling from shared life experiences, pulling from transferable skills, and bringing them to bear to say no problem is too big and nothing is impossible. I love that. And, you know, resilience is one of the biggest words that I use when talking about living with food allergies. I feel like that and, and, and pushing through fear, it's so much of what we talk about in this community. So it's fascinating that it's mirrored in the, the living of the food allergy life with also in the entrepreneurial life. So I love hearing that. I want to just say one quick reminder to those watching again, if you have any questions for these three brilliant entrepreneurs that you would like to ask, hit us in the comment section and we'll try to get to them at the end. Okay, this is what I've been super excited to talk about with you guys. As I mentioned at the beginning, and as you know, we had a little meet and greet chat a few weeks ago and something came out of it that was so beautiful. I called it the three P's, pivot, permission, and paying it forward. You all have these beautiful, beautiful, things that you wanted to share. And so I wanna make sure we get to it. The first is pivot, which is like my favorite word in the world. Women often have to pivot. We pivot, you know, because of what's going on in our personal lives. We pivot because of what's going on in our professional lives, we're children. We're constantly having to sort of take these big turns and make it work, right? So how do you, how did you each have to pivot? What happened in your life to cause that pivot to start this business? Um, I want to make sure I'm like going out of order. I'm going to, Nicole, I'm going to start with you. Perfect. Well, I, I think one pivot I'll share is actually a pivot that happened within the business. Um, right. And it goes to the point of uh, resilience. So we launched Everybody Eats on March 1st, 2020. Oh my. <laughs> we, we had a leadership meeting on March 11th, 2020 and shut down the business. Oh my. And on March 13, 2020, closed the kitchen and moved 900 cases of product to uh, my co founder's living room. And we said, we have just been hit with a pandemic. <laughs> How do we protect our people, our products, and our position in the market? And what we did is we took our lot traceability system, we took our materials resource planning system. And we created a warehouse in that living room <laughs> and we fulfilled 900 cases of products. There were trucks pulling up to the front of her house. We, we had like a chain of people taking boxes out the front door. Um, but it really had to, it really had to do with taking away this idea that we were going to be a food service business. We were going to go into restaurants. We were mm. going to focus uh, in a completely different way to say, you know what, it's going to be, it's going to be brick and mortar and it's going to be online. 
and it's going to be okay. And that's a, that's what we did, but that was a big, a big pivot. And there was a lot of um, opportunity to be paralyzed with fear and say, what do we do? But, you know, another P is powering through and that's, uh, (laughs) that's what we did. Yes. I love it. I love it. Wow. That is super impressive. I mean, that is like a ginormous pivot. So congratulations for making it through that. Um, Sarah, how about you? Is there a time that you really had to pivot either starting Hungry Harry's or, or during the business's run? Um, again, it comes down to the pandemic. I'm, I was working on Hungry Harry's part-time, but still doing my documentary work. And I do political documentary. So I'm with candidates or presidents or whatever and in various situations. One particular day that I baked and photographed cookies in the morning and a presidential candidate in the afternoon. Pandemic hit and all of my political documentary work disappeared. So I was like, right, 100% in, all in. So I went from photographing somebody on a big stage to looking at food photography, which is still photography, but it's a different element of using the medium. So there was a Mm. lot of upskilling, lots of videos, lots of calling friends. How do you do this? And then it was how to tell the story and the story isn't just our story it's not our hungry harry's is not our story it's the story of our home bakers and our customers so we started our home bakers and our star bakers and we collected a group of families across the country and just um and then sent them product and then taught them how to make photos and send them to us and then we started talking about their journey and we wanted something, the pandemic was all about change and we wanted something consistent. So it was like, right, every week we're going to bake this. Every week we're going to talk about this. We're going to do webinars together. We're going to do Facebook Lives. Here's my number. Text me if you need me. It's going to be okay. We have to focus on the forward. Um, so that's how we pivoted. I love it. And we're going to talk more about using our voices and stories and storytelling in a minute. So I'm so happy you brought that up. But I do want to hear from Nubian about any time you really had to pivot, whether it was starting your business or or since you started your business. So prior to the Pink Bakery, I was a graphic designer. I had no interest in baking. Like I said before, I didn't even know how to bake. Um, (laughs) So but again, there were there were several situations that kept happening where I was encountering um, like other people and in different environments, like party environments or meeting environments where there was never anything for me to eat. And I was tired of people trying to push fruit on me because fruit's like the, the go to for everybody. Right. With food allergies. Oh, just go get the fruit. And it was like, no, I want a muffin. I want some brownies. I, I want the same thing you guys are eating. And so. I said to myself, well, I can bake, like, you know, whatever. I can figure out anything, right? Like, so super ambitious and had no clue what I was getting myself into. So I, I pivoted from graphic design into baking. And I think baking has probably been the most humbling thing I have ever done in my whole life. <laughs> Again, especially baking without, you know, the, the, the ingredients that are needed to make traditional desserts. Um, but I'll have to say, like, for me, it was such a, a world that I, I didn't know anything about it. Like, I had no experience at all, even in the food industry space, right? Like, learning about all these, these uh, relationships and all the systems that work in the food industry space. But um, I'm so glad that I was able to take um, what I consider in the graphic design world, like, the blank space. I don't know if you've ever found anything, but there's, like, this blank space in Adobe um, illustrator or photoshop and you're able to be as creative as you want to be on this blank on this blank slate and so i would take that out that's how i would make cakes i would listen to the story of my customers and i would design on this cake space so even though it was a complete pivot i still was able to bring things that i learned in the in the previous business to this one and so i just look forward to all the things that i'm going to be learning moving forward that is so amazing. And I, I hear this over and over and over with, with the people that I have the opportunity to chat with for take action. And it's happened in my own life too. And I, again, while this can be a man or a woman thing, we're, we, we love all the genders here. I do feel like it's kind of woman specific. Like we know that we can use whatever experience we've had towards the next thing. So whether it's graphic design to baking or photography to starting Hungry Harry's, and I hope that's something that people are watching can hold on to. No matter what you're doing now, you can use that experience and make it relevant for whatever you do next. And you all are perfect examples of that. 
let's talk about the next P, permission. So something that came up is that we know that we need, we need permission to do things. And I think sometimes women feel like they need to get the permission from someone else. And we were all talking about, we need to give ourselves the permission, right? Like we are grownups, we are women, we can do this without anybody else telling us it's okay. Um, so Nubian, I'm gonna go right back to you. Tell me how you feel about the whole concept of permission and just knowing that you're gonna go with what you feel like is the right thing to do without needing anybody else's approval. Yeah, when I first started out, um, again, this this industry was dominated by, by white males, right? Um, and so me sitting in, in this space, coming in, asking questions, I got a lot of resistance. And I felt like, well, maybe I won't be successful because these people haven't given me the permission. They haven't said, oh, it's okay for you to come through the doors. So I decided one day, I don't need their permission anymore. I, I'm working in, walking in purpose. And when you walk in purpose, it doesn't matter what anybody on this earth says about you or what you've been brought here to do. So I don't worry about anybody else's permission. I pray, I get my answer, and I keep moving forward. I love it. Nicole, how about you? How do you feel about the big old P word permission? <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, I think as soon as you, the sooner you learn to give it to yourself, the better. And I think that, um, I feel like there's all these other P's that are coming up. I think for some people, for me, I find that being prepared is how I justify giving myself permission. It's one of those where, um, uh, as we, as, as, as my co-founder Trish and I were, were launching the company, we were looking for co-manufacturers all over the place. And everyone said, well, we don't do top 14 allergens and corn, you know, good luck. And we looked at each other and we said, we're going to have to do this ourselves. And I said, you know what? I grew up at PepsiCo. I did mergers and acquisitions. I've been through a lot of factories in my day. We're, we're, we are going to do it ourselves and I'm going to build it. <laughs> and so there were so many folks who would look at us and, you know, kind of go through our, uh, our presentations and say, well, well, who's doing the manufacturing? Well, who's leading the manufacturing? You know, and I'd say I am and Trish would say Nicole is. And all of a sudden it was this look like, but you don't know anything about manufacturing. And I'm like, oh, you just wait. And so, <laughs> but I knew that I was prepared. I had been preparing for years to run a company and had spent a good fair bit of time in manufacturing and studying it. And so gave myself the permission to lean in and fearlessly ask for help from those who could offer help but lead the way. And so that is, that's one of those where a prep, figure, figure out what it takes to make you comfortable giving yourself permission and do that. Such amazing advice. And you're totally right about the being prepared. That's how I feel confident and not stressed in a situation or anxious is if I know I really know my stuff. So that's another excellent P word. Sarah, <laughs> I'm coming back to you. Let's talk about permission. How do you feel about permission? I think you need to give yourself permission, but you kind of have to, somebody needs to stop you and go, give yourself permission. Or you say to somebody else, I don't need your permission. To <laughs> yeah. And it dawned on me when I, you know, I went back to school at 47 to study photo and then I'm with Secret Service clearance photographing all these people I only ever saw on television. And then now I'm doing using all of that. Yeah, you can do this. You can ring the CEO of somebody or other and you can have a conversation with them. And I'm like, yeah, I'll do that. One thing that comes with permission is responsibility. Mm -hmm. so you don't need anybody's permission, but your success is 100% your own responsibility. So there is that open the gate go reach forward, do whatever you want, pick your chin up, put your hands out and believe that opportunity is yours. But you are responsible for that, for optimizing that opportunity. I love it. Not a P word. <laughs> yes. You guys, such amazing advice. And we're going to get to our last P, although if you keep thinking of P's, we can keep going with this because it's going really well. <laughs> um, but a lot of what you talked about, we were getting to know each other and we've been talking about it a little bit today is paying it forward. And kind of in line with that is women supporting women um, instead of being in competition with one another, but paying it forward to other women with food allergies, other entrepreneurs. 
tell me how you feel about paying it forward and ways that you're paying it forward as a female entrepreneur. Sarah, I'm going to come back to you. I, I would have to say that our home bakers and star bakers are just magic. <sighs> We know what it's like when you stand in front of the supermarket and there's nothing you can eat and you're just like, you, you're deflated and you've defeated. And life's not supposed to be like that. All we want to do is eat and eat a cake or a muffin or, what, or pancakes or whatever. So with the home bakers, we have one beautiful home baker. Her name's Linnell and she's in Michigan and she has two sons with very severe allergies and eczema. She never, she's African-American. She never had fried chicken. Her kids had never had fried chicken. And I was like, hang on a minute. And so developed a fried chicken recipe. And she was like, I can do this. And I said, you can do this. But more importantly, your son can do this. Mm -hmm. She was incredibly nervous about letting her child in the kitchen to cook. And I went, hang on. It's a life skill that our kids need. So we need to support them to learn how to do it. And so we've got stories from every type of person, every type of family, every ethnic background, every religious background, but it all centers on how do they manage their food allergies in a positive way. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Nicole, tell me how you feel about paying it forward in ways that you're doing that in your business. Absolutely. Paying it forward. There are so many people who over time and throughout my life have poured into me and so paying it forward is just, it, it really is, I, I see as the, um, um, the, the cost of, of, of all the good that has happened to me. And so one of the ways that we pay it forward here at Everybody Eat, more peas I'm throwing your way, Hillary. Um, <laughs> but I call it, um, I actually call it privilege by proxy. And we have really identified how do we as a leadership team leverage our privilege in service of our employees. And that's everything from hopping on the phone with credit lenders who are adopting predatory lending practices against our team. It is making them bankable by taking them to Bank of America in our cars and sitting there with them through those appointments. It is money management classes. It's one-on-one -on -one budgeting classes. It's nutrition classes so that our employees who come from Chicago's South and West sides who have heard all their lives like you have, maybe on black people don't have food allergies, start learning about what we do and the importance of understanding and listening to your bodies and say, you know what, my younger cousin who always has tummy trouble, I think actually this could be an issue with gluten. And so they start to take that knowledge into their families and into their communities in a way that is non-threatening and comes from a place of trust. But really for us, paying it forward is about understanding that we have a foot in both worlds and how do we become that bridge back and forth so that our teammates and our team members have more access and opportunity? I love that. So incredibly impressive. And people who get to work for your organization are quite lucky to get all of that additional training and, and understanding. So thank you for sharing. Moving on, tell us. Paying um, it forward. Yeah. So I would have to echo um, what Nicole said about so many people have poured into me. Um, and again, when you're, when you're entering into a new business or you're learning something new, you depend on, I always pray for guides that will come and assist me on the journey, right? And so you're so thankful to that person that said, oh, newbie, go that way, right? Or mm, go that way, right? So um, because of that, I feel like it's my responsibility to give back. We've always, the Pink Bakery has always um, been very very much so about giving back to food allergy organizations. But we've also this year branched out into another organization, but um, it's called the Birthday Party Project. And in this project, there are children that live in homeless shelters that would not get traditional birthday parties because they, they no longer have a home. And so we donate money to them. And so we're, we're so proud of that because, um, Again, I have no idea what it feels like to be homeless. And especially with the pandemic, there's been a huge amount of people that have become homeless because of that. So we, we give back that way. Um, I also, prior to moving back to Milwaukee, and I didn't talk about this pivot, I lived in Memphis and had to move because of the pandemic. But I speak to, um, through the epicenter, I speak to entrepreneurs 
um, about marketing. And as I think we've spoken to about 100 um, entrepreneurs about marketing. And then um, we just recently, we love donating to causes. So we just recently gave some product to Make-A-Wish. So I'm always trying to find ways to um, touch places in the community and, and not, not always, always, again, our food allergy organizations, because there's a lot of us that are in other organizations also that have food allergies too. So it's me trying to find ways to spread, you know, the pink, the pink bakery in all kinds of different places. I love that. So impactful in so many different ways. Thank you so much for all you do and for sharing um, and great to hear about the birthday project. I'm going to go look that up. Sounds like a really special organization. You guys, we have a bunch of questions from our audience. So I'm going to pop through some of these to make sure we, we get to them. Um, Sarah, I have one for you. As a 16 year old, how does Harry feel about having his name <laughs> and story in stores across the country? Um, he's starting to like it again. Uh, from about 14 to 16, he was about ee, ee, ee. <laughs> when we had a, um, an episode recently where his friend, we're in Mar we're based in Chicago and we have Mariano's as the store and we're in all of the Mariano stores. So that's 45, 46 of them. Um, and his friends were in different stores around the city and they were taking photos of the product sitting on shelf and then they'd take a photo and send it to him and he was, he'd was he come down and say, look at this. And he went, I'm actually really proud. And uh -huh. I was just like, uh -huh. of course I cried. Um, but it was, <laughs> we, you know, because we got to a point where he was like a little resistant. Now he's really engaged, but more specifically, his friends are engaged. So those that are interested in entrepreneurship, and when you say that word to kids, they're like, big what does it mean it's something about business so they see us working making photos doing meetings and it's his friends and also him their perception of entrepreneurship and business changes so they're at a stage where they see that as valuable so I love that so much and I think you know all of us everything we do is for our children right and we hope that they're proud of us and they we hope that they in some small way understand what they're doing so I mean that's like the greatest compliment that, that oh, yeah. he is so into it. So I love that. Awesome. Thank you. I have a few additional questions. Um, Nubian, I'm going to ask you this one. What do you feel was your greatest overcoming moment? Um, regarding my food allergies or entrepreneurship? Let's talk about for your business. I mean, you can answer it either way, but probably focused on your business. Um, I think surviving the pandemic, honestly. <laughs> Because, and, I, and I don't think I handled it well. I didn't, I didn't understand because like we used to bake for people. We used to actually bake wedding cakes, school, you know, stuff for schools. Um, I had right before the pandemic happened, we had a contract with a hospital. And I also had some land that was under contract. We were going to build the pink bakery. And so all that shifted and I didn't understand. And I'm big on spirituality and trying to listen for the answer. And so um you know, came back to Milwaukee. It's cold here. It's nothing like Memphis, right? Well, Memphis is so warm. <laughs> but it was so cold here and I wasn't used to that. So I had to get back used to the weather. And um, it was like, what do I do? Like, how do I move forward? Because now we pivoted from baking to baking mixes. That's a different customer. Mm -hmm. Because my that enjoy just picking something up and me baking is different from, okay, I promise all you have to do is add oil and water. I promise it's gonna work every time, right? They're like, girl, I don't bake. There's no way I can do this. And I'm like, you can, I promise it's gonna work every time, right? Um, and so, and then moving away from my market, I, I left, right? So it's like, how do I start over? Thankfully, prayerfully, you know, we have, it, it, was, it was probably the best thing that could have happened to us. We just formed a partnership with Marquette University so our baked goods are now in markets. It's called the Simple Servings Dining Hall. Um, so that's a huge thing. We've been exposed to so many incredible people, Beyonce, Tabitha Brown, James Beard. Like, it's just been in crazy, I mean, incredible. <laughs> it's been crazy too, but incredible. <laughs> so I'm a firm believer in trusting the journey, even when you can't see, even when you don't understand, because I didn't understand none of that. I'm like, what? Move? What? <laughs> what? You know, how do you handle that? And there's, everybody was going through it. So I, I'm not the only one that was depressed, but it was like, 
how do I recover from this? I didn't know how. And so there were many sad days and sad nights. And I'm thankful for my mom who was just like, keep going, you know, like just that gentle nod every now and then. Cause I'm like, I'm going to quit, you know, it's over. She's like, no, just keep going. So it's a totally different thing. So um, we're moving in amazing directions. Again, I'm so excited for all the things we're about to encounter. And um, so yeah, surviving the pandemic. That's, you know, that, that little thing, just that little hiccup. (laughs) That's amazing. And we've gotten several questions that are kind of along the same lines. So Nicole, I'm going to let you ask, uh, answer something that's similar. I know we talked very much about your, your pivot during the pandemic, but someone asked, what is the best unexpected thing or moment that you've had happen to you since you began your business? So that'd be the best. So pandemic is probably not the best, but (laughs) you have something positive that happened that was a surprise. Of course, of course. And I'll tell you, the, the pandemic wasn't all bad. It, it made us sit down. It made us reset. It made us reevaluate. It made us think strategy um, instead of just go, go, go. So there is that, you know, trying to find that, 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 that silver lining um, or that opportunity in the midst of chaos. But I'll tell you, probably the single most exciting event that happened to us was um, when we were authorized to go national in Whole Foods. Um, which is happening like <laughs> happening right now. We're loading <laughs> trucks and everything right now. Um, but what it was is we, we started off in Illinois and our blueprint is always to do something small, prove it out, go a little bigger, prove it out. That's how we've scaled the business. So we started in Illinois. Um, that went well. We were authorized to go um, into the Midwest and that went well. And then we started saying, okay, well, maybe we'll ask if we can go into a few more regions, like maybe another three. And we were just sort of carefully plotting our course. And then our, our partner um, who's worked with us and watched the business said, instead of just three or four reasons, how about national? We all just sort of said, wait, what? <laughs> like my you know, and, and, you know, And then everyone around the table was like, yes, tell him yes. And I like hit mute. I was like, wait, we have to figure out if we could do this. I mean, it was like, you know, you're breaking up, you're breaking up um, because we had to figure out if we make this commitment, we've got to deliver and we've got to deliver in spades. And that's something that we cannot take lightly. And so we said, you know what, it's one of those where, um, you know, you, uh, you say like, okay, that sounds great. We'll take it under consideration. And you hang up the phone and you go like this. Yes. And then head down in spreadsheets, like, okay, yes. can we do this? Can we do this? So We answered the question and said that we could, um, knew that it was going to take all hands on deck from everyone in the entire organization. And then we said, you know, are we aligned? Can we commit to this? And then called back and said, okay, we'll do it. Um, But that was one where it was, um, it was, it was such a huge validation of the work that we do in service of our consumers, our employees, and, and that the idea of bringing people together over shared love of food is, is important and it's big um, and that we're actually chipping away at solving the problem. That's fantastic. You guys have had such incredible journeys and I love hearing all of these pivots and all of these things you've overcome and happy surprises. Um, I know we're going to have to wrap up semi-shortly and somebody else just asked a question, which I did have on my list, which is such a good one. What piece of advice would you give your younger selves? So Sarah, I'm going to come back to you. What, what piece of advice would you give young Sarah? Um, believe in yourself and just do it. You know? Rock on, sister. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, and it's like um, define yourself early. So we often go through life and we go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we kind of get, we assimilate with different communities and do whatever. Spend some time on defining your values, your interests, your talents and capabilities, and then find an opportunity and go for it. When you go for that opportunity, you are, I'll come back to responsible. You are responsible for how it comes out, but give yourself permission to go and do that. Love it. Thank you so much. Nubian, how about you? Um, So the advice I would give my younger self is to tell myself there's nothing wrong with me um, because I internalized everything that was happening when I was younger. Um, I would say everything's going to be okay. And you'll find a tribe of millions who are just like you. Build community with them. 
Your existence helps the rest of the world understand the severity of food allergies. It's so beautiful. I love that so much. Thank you for sharing that. Nicole, how about you? What would you tell your younger self? I would tell young Nicole, um, know your worth and know your why. And so some of that is very similar to um, what Nubian has said. And then also what Sarah has said very early on, knowing your worth, define yourself as Sarah said, so that you know your worth um, and that you know that your, your uh, voice is powerful, that you are skilled, that you are capable, that you're resilient, that, you know, you're a hellraiser if you want to be, you know, that you're, that you're, um, that you, you can run with the big dogs. So go ahead and get off the porch, you know, and then it would also be, but, but be anchored in that. And that's knowing your why. And for me, it took a, it took a little while to figure out my why, but it, it was realizing that it's not just about me. It's about those who came before me to blaze a trail and those who are coming after me. And that my job is to make sure that in this part of the race, I carry a baton that's worth passing. And so when I'm thinking about my younger self to be able to say, identifying that why even earlier, I think then helps with that fire in your belly and helps you get up when you fall down and you celebrate even more when you have the high highs. I love that so much. I feel like I've said I've loved that so much this whole time, but I do. (laughs) You guys have so much to say. And this is the only one, this is all about listening to your expertise and your journeys, but this is one where I'm going to pile on. I would tell my younger self that everything that happens to you happens for a reason and to use that towards your next step, to, to know that it becomes your story. It becomes your work. It becomes what's important to your values. You know, when you have two kids who are diagnosed with food allergies or you yourself are diagnosed with food allergies or celiac or intolerances, it feels so overwhelming and it feels so scary. Um, but it becomes, it becomes your superpower. It becomes your why. It becomes why I do the work I do and the work that you do. And so I loved also to be on what you said, nothing's wrong with you. You're just, it's your, it's your unique thing. And guess what? There's millions and millions and millions of us who deal with this. So I just had to pile on there because I was feeling it, you guys. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We're going to come to some closing thoughts. I would like for each of you just to give us a little preview of what, what's next for your businesses. Is there a new place we can find you, any new products, or just tell us everyone who's watching where we can find you online, your social media, where you are in real stores. Give us your like your one minute, two minute elevator pitch with all of the promotion you want to give us. <laughs> uh, Nicole, let's go with you. Perfect. So um, starting April 1st, you'll be able to find us in all 500 Whole Foods <laughs> that, uh, that, we have, uh, that we have identified as everybody eat Whole Foods. Um, you can also find us, uh, you'll be able to find our crisp breads, which is a product that uh, we just launched. Um, also in Whole Foods in the Midwest here, um, we'll be rolling those out shortly. Um, our goal really is to start bringing our innovation pipeline to bear um, as we march towards center of plate so that there are so many different ways that folks can um, enjoy our products as well as make them their own. And then you can also find them on our web- website, everybodyeating.com. You can find us on Thrive. You can also find us on Amazon. And then our Instagram is everybody underscore eating. And you can also find us on uh, Facebook. We would love to hear from you. Our consumers are um, our inspiration for our innovation pipeline. Um, and we would love to see you enjoying our products. So um, let us know. They, you, our, our consumers, you really are. Our, our, our heartbeat um, and what keeps and what keeps us going. So reach out to us because we, we will happily reach back out to you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Nubian, how about you? What's next for the Pink Bakery? So what's next for the Pink Bakery, which I'm so excited about because it's been a very long time in the making, <laughs> is <laughs> certifications that we'll be rolling out soon. Um, and I'm so happy about it's gluten-free and kosher. Um, so, Lord, if anybody's been through that process, oh my God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> with, with our own manufacturing facility, that's like a whole nother layer of scrutiny and, you know, just all that. So I've grown a lot. 
But um, so yeah, so that's coming. We have some um, other flavors that we are converting over from, you know, how I used to bake them into baking mixes. So that stuff should be available later this year. Everybody can find our stuff, our amazing top allergen free premium baking mixes at thepinkbakery.com. You can follow us on Insta, well, all our social media um, platforms are at the Pink Bakery DM. The DM stands for dessert mixes. If you go to Marquette University, you can just run on down to the simple serving stations <laughs> and um, pick up, you know, brownies, cookies, whatever. They bake it all. Um, and then we have two stores here in Wisconsin or two places here in Wisconsin that sell our products retail. Um, and that is Wellness for Life Health Clinic and then Plant Tonic Cafe. So you can find us at those places as well. Fantastic. Could you give us your social media? People can find you. I know you said website. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the social media is the Pink Bakery DM. The DM stands for dessert mixes. So Good. the Pink yeah. Got it. Got it. I wanted to make extra sure we had that in there. I feel like that's like where everyone meets these days is on social media. Sarah, how about you? Give us, give us what's next and where we can find you. Okay, we've just relaunched our website. And if you go to hungryharrys.com, you will see a cornucopia of food and delicious desserts and cakes and muffins and everything you can actually bake with our five baking mixes. We're adding stores all the time. We added 15 stores last week. Um, so we're increasing our footprint. We're doing another, we've actually doubled our production run. So the next production run is twice as big as the last one. So we're growing in that area. Um, and we've also got lots of opportunity in institutional. So we're talking to destinations, hotels, you know, healthcare, hospitals, daycares, and showing them that they can bake allergy friendly, not for just the allergy food kid that's in the room or person who needs the allergy friendly food, but for all, because everybody is included. So yeah, very focused on what we do and um, just working hard. Love it. You guys are all such an inspiration. And this has been such an awesome, awesome conversation. I know that everyone who's watching really enjoys it. And I know that Sarah's going to show this around on the website and social media, of course, as we're talking about where to find things. Food Allergy Research and Education Fair, foodallergy.org is where you find all of the really important, very factual, up-to-date food allergy information. If anybody wants to follow along with me, you can find me on social media at Hillary Toll Carter. And my website is hillarytollcarter.com. I have loved every minute chatting with you guys. Thank you so, so much for all you do for the food allergy community, for women-owned businesses, for entrepreneurs. I mean, I want to say, you know, a bad word like that. You know, you guys are rock stars. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And everyone who's watching, thank you for joining us as well. And make sure and follow all these fantastic ladies and see what happens next. Thank you, guys. Bye. See you guys. Thank you, Hillary. Bye. 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 Bye.